Hi, everybody. My name is David Leeson. I'm your proud host of Leaders on the Frontier. And today, on April the 4th, 2024, the year of our Lord, we're delighted to have a, another live discussion with you, our audience, on both X and YouTube. So a warm welcome to all of you. I hope you're having a, a, a great spring right across our country. And we're delighted by the participation. We're getting thousands of people on our live discussion, and we really do appreciate your input. So make sure that you think about your questions that you want to pose. Make sure you like this and share it with your friends. We uh, want to get the word out on very important issues that affect Canadians' lives. So we're, uh, we're really honored that you can join us today. So on that note, I'm very um, excited. I'm not sure what the best word to use is, but we have a very important topic today, and it's about eco-terrorism. Um, and it's hard to believe in Canada, we don't think of our country our peaceful Canada, where we order, where we value, pardon me, peace, order, and good government, that we don't think of terrorism existing right beneath our noses. Well, but that's been the story for the last several years. And my next guest is a senior researcher, associate at the Frontier Center for Public Policy. He's written a paper that was just issued this past week from Frontier about the topic of eco-terrorism. And uh, the title of that paper, and I encourage you to look at it on the website, is The Deadly Fruits of Climate Change Alarmism, The Looming Eco-Extremist uh, eco Threat, and Why We Must Stop Ignoring It. So I think that's quite a title and kind of summarizes where we're going today. We're going to talk about the terrorism that's occurring in our country that's really founded on the whole notion that uh, we have uh, a existential threat from climate change. And uh, you may hear this all the time uh, as the federal government just uh, tabled uh, record numbers of, of advertising dollars, some $16 million, I believe, if memory serves me correctly, where the federal government keeps um, the steady drumbeat that our climate is in deep crisis and that we face an existential threat. So we're going to, I want to welcome Joseph Cornell, our associate at the Frontier Centre. Joseph has an extensive research background on many different policy areas from resource projects to the area of Indigenous policy. Um, but Joseph is a very insightful um, policy analyst. So a warm welcome to you, Joseph. We're so glad you could join us today. Hey. Thank you. I really appreciate the invitation, David, and uh, it's a great topic, and I'm definitely willing to get into it. Well, Joseph, um, I think you've done a masterful job here because you really um, lay out, I think, a, both a strategic picture, but also one that's filled with really a lot of examples where um, eco-terrorism is really impacting the lives of Canadians. So let's start off with a really basic question. What the heck is eco-terrorism well it's it's extremism that's motivated by uh environmental causes right so like we're not talking about your average uh you know environmentalism that's a lot of it is very practical it's reasonable and usually you know a good science science based so but we're talking about people that have uh usually taken certain environmental beliefs to a certain degree that they've reached a point where they believe that they can commit certain acts. So oftentimes it's sabotage or property damage or just intimidation of people. Mm -hmm. And as we'll get to later, you know, in, uh, in the UK, you know, in, in, in Europe, we've seen examples where people motivated by this have, uh, have created situations that have led to, de so to some deaths, some bodily harm. Um, so, yeah, it's uh, a lot of people, especially, Actually, right now, right, we're looking at Gaza with, with Hamas uh, on October 7th. We think, okay, those are terrorists, and everyone agrees on that. But when we talk about terrorism, we have to understand that it, it, it doesn't necessarily always mean death involved. It doesn't, you know, that um, it's really the motive uh, for, for what you're doing and, what you're tr and why you're trying to do it, right? Uh, so if, um, if you have some kind of uh, ideological, religious, or any type of belief that will motivate you to generally to kind of commit usually indiscriminate 
but not always, uh, a, you know, um, attack on innocent people, and usually for mm -hmm. intimidation. And so, you know, it doesn't it can involve bodily harm, but it can also involve property destruction or anything like that. Okay, so this is pretty far-reaching stuff here. So eco-terrorism, if I'm understanding you, really is, there's a whole group of people, a network out there that attack property, in some cases, even people, mm -hmm. but they basically are functioning outside the law to create fear, to really intimidate people. They do a lot of enormous damage. I think there's example after example of this. So, I want to just give one one example, Joseph, that that you outline and talk about is this incredible project to bring liquefied natural gas across the West to the West Coast. And in northern BC, well, it's called. Well, can you tell us about this project and what happened essentially? Well, we t we're t so so the coastal gas link in particular, this project bringing LNG from Dawson Creek all the way to uh, Kitimat and then, and then, you know, uh, to bring LNG to Asian markets, right. To Tidewater. Mm -hmm. And so th there was a lot of uh, opposition to it. Uh, not just on, uh, on just strictly climate change related reasons, but also indigenous reasons. A lot of people felt that indigenous people weren't uh, adequately um, consulted. And there was, a, a, there was a, and anyway, everyone saw this and, uh, Late 2019 to 2020, uh, we saw uh, a bunch of elders uh, with, with the Wet'suwet'en community, one particular First Nation along the route of Coastal Gas Link that uh, really got um, started uh, doing what they call, I guess, in uh, you know direct action, started, they call themselves land defenders, right? So it's usually a euphemism that's used, and they actually started becoming very confrontational. And that led to, you know, Canadians felt the impact of this. Uh, we all felt the, uh, you know, uh, a lot of First Nations, but not exclusively, definitely. A lot of non-Indigenous protesters and anarchists started uh, using what they would call solidarity actions all across Canada. And so what, and you also, what we also saw, and this would kind of get into what we're talking about, uh, there were uh, rail blockades. And I remember, you know, a lot of Canadians remember that. Uh, people started noticing um, uh that you know, when rail started getting delayed, they started the goods in grocery stores and heating oil. I remember out here, I'm out in Nova mm -hmm. Scotia. Uh, there were solidarity blockades all the way to Dartmouth, to Halifax. That 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 actually per, that started interfering with uh, with uh, uh, propane store propane shipments. So that you know, you had a lot of people on fixed incomes that were just complaining about saying, but this is all mm -hmm. based on on the coastal gas link and the Wet'suwet'en, and, and Mm -hmm. uh, at the same time, right, uh, you had a lot of non-Indigenous people that started uh, engaging in acts of sabotage in support of them. I know we can get into that. That's one of the ideological motivations. To be clear, um, you had quite a network of, of uh, environmental activists and, and others that wanted to stop the project, in spite of it also having considerable support from various First Nations, across the line. And this is a, a, a massive project. Um, uh, I believe that the, the number of jobs uh, really are in the numbers of thousands. And uh, this will create enormous wealth and prosperity for all of, all of Canada, but particularly for First Nations along, along the route, uh, because there's a, you know, a lot of agreements. But what, what's happened though, is that you had um, blockages of, of national railway lines and I believe you also had a series of violent acts, uh, uh, situations where protesters created fires on the property of uh, of uh, the 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 company involved, and uh, even people wielding axes and destroying millions of dollars worth of property and threatening workers. Uh, yeah. So this was a significant uh, action. People wore masks. Um, I mean, these were these were this is a very serious action, and I know that uh, police announced that they were searching for um, these armed protesters who were clearly violating the law on so many accounts. Has anyone been arrested, to your knowledge? No. So the uh, the RCMP did conduct an extensive investigation. They there is a there's a specialized unit within the uh, within the RCMP that that looks at attacks against uh, the energy industry, like big infrastructure. 
So, and uh, to its okay. credit, I think the, you know the RCMP did did establish that. But like like you were saying, like the the most prominent example was in February 2022, when 20 masked assailants entered a um, a, a coastal gas link work site near Houston, British Columbia, and uh, they were you know they they intimidated security and workers. The workers had to fl had to flee, and they had flare guns. And that they came onto the site and they actually, so after they had left, they commandeered some of these vehicles and then used them to attack other vehicles. So there is, wow. there's like uh, tens of millions of dollars, according to the BC contractors organization mm -hmm. that said mm -hmm. that was done that day. And for me, looking at that, for what I was saying before about the definition of terrorism, right? Uh, ideological motivation to intimidate the public that could involve pu uh, public mm -hmm you know, a uh, harm of people mm. and uh, property damage that qualifies. Right. Mm -hmm. And, um, and before, e even, uh, even before the, that, that particular February event, like you were saying before, there were events out of uh, the Wet'suwet'en community. There definitely were, uh, there were, there were small, small scale, right. You had people coming in in masks. Mm. They were stealing things. Uh, they were trying to sabotage, uh, you know, oil field equipment. They were trying to, uh, uh, take vehicles. So like you, we didn't hear about these. We only heard, and I, you know, and not for very long, even the February, 2022 uh, terror attack, I'm going to call it, um, you know, this was happening all the time. Mm -hmm. So these are significant acts of violence. I do remember very well the statements by elected chiefs by the first nations coming together saying these protesters, these people of violence, are terrorizing our communities, they're intimidating us, they're creating fear, and they're not welcome in our community. So this was in complete contrast with their message of somehow that they are the saviors of these communities, when in fact, the uh, officials themselves of the First Nations that were duly elected were saying, you're not welcome. So I found that to be a, a very powerful example where you had people intruding in these First Nations, disrupting people's lives and exercising violence. So isn't that kind of ironic, Joseph, that that's part of the dynamic of what's going on with these so-called eco-terrorists? Exactly. Like, we look at Wet'suwet'en, uh, the, um, the elected chief, the Indian Act elected, granted, but those were the duly elected officials that represented that, those First mm -hmm. Nation communities. They signed an agreement with Coastal Gas Link. And also, this was reaffirmed in a public vote on it. And so a group of what called themselves hereditary chiefs took upon themselves to claim that th th they could oppose this. Now, there's a lot of insider dirty, you know, dirty laundry. I know some of the hereditary chiefs uh, that were involved in this. And they're definitely, even within that, or even within that body, there was a lot of disagreement about that. A lot of them felt that mm -hmm. th this particular segment of the hereditary chiefs were speaking on their behalf. And it's def it's not a conspiracy or anything of that nature because it's all been documented. We can send this. I can send you this so you can show the viewers and listeners that you know Tides Foundation had funded these or you know these this particular hereditary chiefs. They were behind this. There's a lot of money, right, um, in, involved in that. And so, th like these First Nations, the, 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 in the str in the strongest terms, and a lot of First Nation organizations came out. You know, the First Nation LNG Alliance came forward and said, you know, this is not our way. This is against our teachings. We don't mm -hmm. condone this. But if, if, you, if you look at the actual, uh, the, the whole situation that led to the February attack, uh, there was one individual mm -hmm. by the name of Molly Wickham, who um, she, she, she's an Indigenous person, and she claims to represent this community, the, the, the hereditary chiefs, although some people question that, where... Uh, she was on Facebook and on. She went on an anarchist uh, podcast where she said, "She said we need allies in, among environmentalists and among the anarchist mm. groups, like specifically the anarchist groups." And then, not long after that, we have the February attack. And so, uh, CBC, to its credit, and and a second time wrote an article talking about the influence of anarchists. And they asked mm -hmm. Molly Wickham in particular, they asked her the tough questions. They said, look, you're trying to disassociate yourself from what happened here, but um, you, you were specifically calling, you know, uh, 
for allies. And you, and you shouldn't be surprised when some people uh, answered your call, right? And so there are, when the RCMP investigated this, uh, they looked at all the chatter online and they found some particular anarchist groups. It's always in the major cities in Canada. And there's one in particular in Montreal. It's based in Montreal. It's called the Montreal Counter Information. And it's a anarchist based website. Now, I don't want to give these guys any clicks, but you, to, in order to see, you have to see it to believe it. It's Montreal Counter Information. Go in there. talking about acts of sabotage um, and, and in particular in Coastal Gas Link. I think I'd mentioned this before. Uh, they found a post anonymous, anonymously, of course, where someone said that uh, there was like uh, six or seven or eight, I can't remember the exact number of, uh, they said, look, we're going to commit, we could commit any of these possible six to eight acts of sabotage on pipelines. One of them was involving poking holes in the pipeline and they said but but most of them aren't true but two of them are so right they're playing a game and so th this led the rcmp to obviously look at this and say you know these are some of the people and if you go to that website uh you'll see very clearly and not just coastal gas link uh there's all kinds of projects that are ongoing um right now there's a pro there's an uh, there's an electric vehicle battery plant called north volt it's a swedish company can i in can Quebec. i just back up for just yeah go ahead second, sorry joseph because yeah. honestly you have packed a lot into the last minute here so you're saying that when we talk about hereditary chiefs what does that mean are are these people that have kind of have a kind of a bloodline and that somehow they have a kind of a ceremonial importance what, what's going on there? What do you mean by hereditary? Okay, chief? yeah, sorry, I should clarify that. So, so hereditary chiefs, they are they're they're unelected. They are they're hereditary, so it's a passed down position. It's to recognize mm -hmm. the importance of family and clan within First Nations societies, mm -hmm. in particular British Columbia. So it's not often outside, and so mm -hmm. that's a totally that's a very legitimate thing with First Nations, uh, in mm -hmm. in British Columbia, a lot of the Pacific Northwest uh, First Nation tribes, and uh, so. What the distinction is, is that hereditary chiefs uh, speak to an older form of Indigenous governance before the Indian Act was imposed through the Indian Act. Hmm. Now, yeah. um, so generally, uh, because they're through different families, the, um, uh, the, the, the chiefs are responsible for certain areas, like regions within the traditional territories that may even extend outside the actual the reserve line, right, created by the Indian hmm. Act. So they're responsible for those things. So there's a very legitimate thing with that. But r right now, um, it's it's a pre-modern institution that's in, that's uh, interacting with a modern in the sense of the Indian Act elected. And so you have a lot of First Nations that still are still really navigating how do we how do we do governance with traditional, mm. the old school that can BC, and the new governance. But what happens in this case is some hereditary chiefs that in this particular case of the Wasuetan, a lot of the connections are those or people that claim to be hereditary chiefs. Uh, it's suspect, right? There's a concern about oh, money really? okay. influencing, like I was saying, uh, uh, about these things. And it, it comes into conflict that if, if certain people say, mm -hmm. you know, we're opposed to uh, this pipeline project, but the elected chief, elected chief and councillors and members support it, what you do? Right. Okay. But to be clear, the hereditary chiefs come out of a more traditional, dare I say, aristocratic form of governance from long ago. And they, some may falsely claim that they're of hereditary background. There's a number of examples of that. Mm -hmm. But in addition to that, we have the democratically elected officials that do have um, decision making power. Yes. Under the Indian Act, they're 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 democratically elected, and they're very much in favor of this project. And yet, you have a handful of hereditary chiefs that have come forward, and it's interesting because it's been confirmed that they've been funded, they've been paid significant um, salaries by the Tides Foundation. So, what is the Tides Foundation, Joseph? Help us understand so, that. So it's a it's a foundation. It's the United States. It's a foreign funded foundation that it's uh, out of the United States. 
Uh, yes, like it started, and but we have Tides Foundation Canada, and so there are a lot of. Uh, um, so what the what the Tides Foundation as a foundation is that it funds environmental organizations. In particular, it mm -hmm. tends to fund mm -hmm. uh, initiatives. Uh, there's very much uh, evidence, you know, looking at the Tides Foundation, how it's connected to things that are attacking the energy sector. So opposing pipelines, all kinds of these projects. Mm -hmm. So uh, mm -hmm. I think the Allen Inquiry in uh, Alberta years ago uh, traced a lot of this money and it found a, a significant amount. Like there's more money for environmental, non-governmental organizations than political parties and different things in Canada. So whoa, sorry, can you yeah. repeat that? What did you just there, say? I th there, there are more like environmental organizations, like the foundations. They are, they're, they're more well resourced than political parties in Canada. Wow. So, so, so it can, I think a lot of Canadians would be shocked to hear that. There's literally tens of millions of dollars, largely foreign money, pouring into Canada to orchestrate these kinds of campaigns against the oil sands, uh, oil campaigns vis-a-vis -vis funding groups that are really violent mm -hmm. and waging terrorist acts on both property and people in this country. That's really the bottom line, isn't it, Joseph? Well, there's there's funding coming in, and they're not. I don't think there's any effort to actually trace how it's being spent or what kind of tactics, right? Like, um, when I was a student back, uh, an undergrad at McGill University, I followed a, a lot yeah. of the protest movement, right? This was, uh, you know, the free trade area of the Americas was in Quebec City, and you had groups that were called the the they were calling themselves the Black Bloc, B L O C. And they were they wore masks, of course, and they would they would be the ones that would come in and do damage. They would smash ATMs and things like that. And what wow. I noticed was so why that did they, why did they wear masks, Joseph? If to hide their, their cause. Why aren't they prepared to be identified? Why do they wear masks? I think it to hide their identity to avoid prosecution. That if you go in there, and what, what I noticed was that all these protests, there were a lot of people there for. You know, they were very legitimate, you know, they had good causes in some respects, but you would have this is usually like, these are protests on the associated with the with the left. They would they would hmm. they wouldn't criticize those who would do these kinds of things, these black block or and what they did was they, they called it like we respect a diversity of tactics. So what do you discover what that means is that if there's some that's like you're you're on a protest and you're just walking down the street and there's a guy beside you, uh, I know, guaranteed to get a fight with the cops or to, or to damage, uh, you know, an ATM or something like that, you, would res you wouldn't criticize that person. Like, you would respect a diversity of tactics, in quotation marks. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's, when we're talking about extremism on the left, uh, in particular, as we're talking about here, that's part of the problem, is that we be it, those that kind of violence or intimidation was normalized. And mm -hmm. no one wanted to criticize, right? It's like when, um, um, you know, you see a protest, like say even the convoy, and if someone goes off and does something, like you had e examples of, you know, the, uh, there were people that apparently uh, interfered with a homeless shelter or something like that with, fee with food or something that was associated with the convoy. Mm -hmm. You had people right away uh, disassociate themselves from those kinds of things and say, no, we don't, these guys don't mm -hmm. speak for us. Um, mm -hmm. So... Uh, on, you, so you see that this is part of the problem, I think, that, you know, we're not wow. taking a stand and, you know. Well, this is uh, very concerning. I'm talking with Senior Research Associate with the Frontier Centre, Joseph Cornell, about a paper that he recently completed called The Deadly Fruits of Climate Change Alarmism, the Looming uh, Eco-Extremist Threat and Why We Must Stop Ignoring It. So, Joseph, um, this uh, paper is certainly an eye-opener, and I encourage anyone to look at it, and I also welcome your questions. But what would you say is the main conclusion from your analysis? I mean, you look at it very closely. Uh, what was the main conclusion that you make in this, this paper? Well, the paper, I would call it's an impassioned plea to, to not ignore this, like to take off the blind spots and the problem that I identify is that, and shockingly to me, that even security agencies, right, CSIS, Public Safety Canada, the, even to a certain degree, the RCMP, are 
they're very focused on extremism associated with the right. Uh, you know, they identified as insul, uh, anti-vax, uh, you know, even things on like gender ideology, but they're ignoring, you know, extremism that's coming from the left. And I think we need to, all institutions that, that uh, you know, the government, media, uh, security agencies need to stop this and they need to focus because this is, it's getting worse. It's not getting better in the sense that, um, so th I called it the deadly fruits of climate change alarmism that I think that a lot of the, not like mainstream uh, climate change views that a lot of people have, but a more, a, a very unscientific apocalyptic views that go well beyond uh, what the science is telling us. Like, uh, and you're starting to see some pushback from this, which is good, but the, uh, like mm -hmm. the IPCC report, if you read the technical reports, like the scientific sorry, what, stuff. What is the IPPC? Oh, I'm sorry, the, the inter provincial, the inter um, panel, um, the, um, the, 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 the international panel on studying climate change, excuse me, that mm -hmm. by the United Nations that came out and is very influential. Uh, I'm just saying, sorry, that kind of set the standard, the gold standard for how we think about climate change. So if, if you read the, the actual technical reports, like where the scientists are talking, uh, mm -hmm. you know, they look at climate change and they look at the serious problems with that, but they, they're very cautious, they're very tentative, and they're not alarmist, mm -hmm. right? They say right. things could change, like this might not, and they actually assign percentages. And there are a lot of things mm -hmm. that, that are not high. Like example, mm -hmm. like I was just reading something that blew my mind that a lot of these extreme weather events that we're seeing it's actually, there's a lot of a high probability that a lot of them are not associated with cli human cause climate change. So, mm -hmm. and I think that there are a lot of people that if you're very motivated by alarmist apocalyptic scenarios that aren't based in the science mm -hmm. and get very mm -hmm. extreme, then I think that that's a, a, a breeding ground for radicalization, right? Like in, mm -hmm. uh, in, in Europe, you have a group called Just Stop Oil which formed in 2022, which intended to, um, their goal was to stop the United Kingdom from any new uh, fossil fuel licenses. And uh, one of their tactics is to stand on the road and prevent people from, from, from going, like in front of cars. And they're starting to cause a big problem. But if you read their, if you read their, um, like their, um, what do you call it? Like their, their charter, like why they were started, it's very, it's very based on extremist rhetoric. It's not, mm -hmm. it's not the tentative, nor rational, science-based climate change. It's very, it's hyper. It's like climate change rhetoric mm -hmm. on steroids, right? Like, wow. very intense. So we're in a situation here where it is interesting that there's a lot of more, much more measured comments, certainly out of the, um, the United Nations now, saying that there is no existential threat from climate. I think actually the chairperson of the panel came out of that just this fall and stated that. But mm -hmm. it's almost like you've got a set of operatives, largely political activists, that take any of that kind of information and magnify it. I can, I can hear um, the, the, the young mm -hmm. Swedish uh, woman, uh, Greta Thunberg, uh, holding up her her, her finger and wagging at us right now saying, how dare you? So yes. it, it's it's almost like people, uh, some are using this type of concern about the environment in the extreme. They are extremists. And and what I find fascinating about your, your, your insight here in your paper, Joseph, and I again, encourage people to look at it, is how so much of this extremism has been normalized. <laughs> in so many of the uh, the narrative on the political side. And so where where does a lot of this kind of narrative come from within our institutions? Because it's certainly not based on the facts and evidence before us. Yeah. Where is it coming from, Joseph? Yeah. So just before I will answer that, I just gonna, this is Just Stop Oil. So I'm looking at this and this is kind of their, their raison d'etre. The group claims extracting new fossil fuels will kill our children, condemn humanity to oblivion, and that human-induced climate change will destroy human civilization unless emergency action is taken to rapidly reduce our greenhouse gas emissions to zero in a very short time scale. Now, that is very much beyond the pale of what scientists and rational people looking at climate change who believe it's real and human-caused are saying. So it's very 
it's ideological. Uh, in terms of, uh, it is coming about in universities. Um, hmm. I, I, as an example, uh, I mentioned this a lot in the pa in the paper. There is a uh, a professor of human ecology, a Swedish gentleman by the name of uh, Andreas uh, Malm, who that I discovered that uh, he wrote a book that was called uh, "How to How to Blow Up a Pipeline." So, and sorry, he wrote a book about how to blow up a pipeline. Yes. He, I watched an interview. Okay. I watched an interview, a podcast for the New Yorker and someone was kind of chiding him saying, well, you know, a lot of people might take this seriously that you're talking about this. And he was saying, well, it's, it's true. This is what, exactly what I'm talking about. And Malm, um, he's a university professor and uh, taking public money and teaching students. And uh, he talked about in this podcast how, how where, where he started was he deflated tires of SUVs, vehicles, in, in, in his area where he grew up. And that's how he started. Mm -hmm. And really what happens is you have people that, that really believe, if you have people believe that it's non-scientific, saying that the earth is on fire, they will, mm -hmm. they will increasingly, increasingly become more radical because they have, it's a self-righteous belief. It's like, but it's sincerely held, I believe. That people think mm -hmm. that uh, if they if that you know dr you know drastic um, things require drastic measures, and, and that's what's happening. That these people, like Malm and others, start believing that that in order to we need to sabotage uh, energy sector infrastructure. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. and one of the things that I noticed was, uh, and I put the, I put this in the paper in the United States, uh, the there was a, an actual law that was introduced where. Uh, some Republican mainly, but not exclusively, legislators called for the FBI to investigate and to uh, mm -hmm. eco-terrorism and saying, look, you have, and it was actually partly inspired by Malm and other academics who are saying this kind of stuff, right? This hyper uh, apocalyptic mm -hmm. rhetoric and v very um, damaging, right? And um, indeed. Yeah. So I'm I'm uh, talking with um, senior associate Joseph Cornell about eco-terrorism. What do you think? Well, one of the questions I have here is probably the best question we've had so far, and that is, what can we do to stop these people? Joseph? Well, in the paper, I argue that uh, the United Kingdom uh, it's just in response to Just Stop Oil and Extinction Rebellion, which the, the second one is an organization that operates in Canada. Um, mm. I think that uh, what they did in the UK was once these people, and I'm not talking about, you know, you're not prosecuting average environmentalists or people with sincerely held reasonable beliefs, but people who take tactics. And in the UK, they started listing these organizations. They started saying Extinction Rebellion, just up oil. These groups pass from lawful advocacy to violent extremism, and then you need we need to to deal with that. And they had a system mm -hmm. where you could just like CSIS. CSIS has a thing that if you suspect someone of extremism or terrorism, they might hurt them, mm -hmm. uh, other people. You can report that. Mm -hmm. And the UK they started. So part of the problem for me was when I started investigating this. I looked at CSIS and I didn't see these kind of organizations listed. I saw like you know, many the you know the traditional Islamist organizations that we think about, mm -hmm. and uh, you know we had a lot of groups that are associated with the. You know, organizations like in the seventies and eighties, um, we had groups like the Earth Liberation Front. Earth First, the Animal Liberation Front. I don't know if these are familiar to you, David, or some other. So environmental mm -hmm. uh, extremism that is motivated by environmental beliefs, it started with those kind of groups, right? You had groups that they would spike trees, like old growth forests. And uh, for animals, you know, they would break into labs. They'd, they would uh, use explosive devices. And so that was the 70s and the 80s. That was environmental extremism. But now mm -hmm. it's morphed mm -hmm. to now it's mainly motivated by climate change rhetoric, like very hyper wow. radical. And I think so uh, having, the, having the courage to identify these groups and that people mm -hmm. can report them. And I think, uh, you know, and prosecuting, right? 
Like, and I think, mm -hmm. um, like, w one of the things that we are seeing in Europe and in Canada, and people could Google this, you see some environmentalists motivated by a belief in climate change, uh, damaging priceless art, right, in, in museums and art galleries. We've seen that all over. And in Europe, so, so rather you're than referring to where, say, in the National Gallery in London, right, these, um, eco terrorists coming up and literally putting some type of food material, like a soup, on a, on a precious piece of art. Yeah, like, like spill sp 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 spill paint. It. Yeah, on the Mona Lisa, right? Yeah. Like throw paint Horrible. or. Yeah. yeah, and and in British Columbia, I believe uh, there was a. And it's starting to happen in Canada. So rather than say, okay, that's just uh, that's just you know what they're saying just prosecuting that and starting with tactics like that mm -hmm. i think like one example was with just stop oil was they would put themselves on the road so i don't see this in canada and i hope this is what i'm hoping for this paper that it leads to we don't allow this is people lying on the road on a major in london and um you know stopping people from going and besides really annoying people and people getting very upset like emergency mm. vehicles like ambulances and fire response units have been limited because of this and in one case and i, I mentioned it in the in the paper um someone associated with just up oil uh climbed onto a bridge in london and so what it did was that caused a detour right people couldn't use the bridge as the police came to respond and uh it caused chaos in all people that were traveling in London and they, they had to go to on an alternate route and it led to some traffic and it led to some traffic accidents and two women um, were, were eventually uh, died as a result of a collision due to wow. their injuries that is associated with the fact that that bridge was blockaded by just up oil people. So Gosh. it's, yeah. it started so a big thing a, saying, yeah. Uh, this is not only a policy issue then that not only impacts the livelihood of people in terms of energy prices and all kinds of things, but it has a profound impact on human life. I mean, these people are literally endangering, if not killing people, when they um, block traffic and, and do all kinds of other things. I mean, I think the example of blocking national railway lines is reprehensible, like the amount of monies, and that went on for weeks. Mm -hmm. Um, and nothing was done. So I, I, I guess for me, um, and this is a fascinating part of your analysis, Joseph, is, uh, and you've alluded to this, it begs the issue, where are our institutions? In this country, in Canada, we have what's referred to as the rule of law. And the rule of law isn't just simply the application of the law equally to mm -hmm. different parties. It involves having uh, professional um, in the ability of police to do um, even enforcement. It yes. also involves uh, courts being able to apply the law in a way that uh, provides a sense of justice being done. Um, I mean, there's a, a variety of aspects of our institutions that allow the rule of law. And it seems to me that your paper really identifies how these institutions are kind of in doubt as they kind of genuflect as they kind of bow before these kinds of um, eco-terrorists and, and, and basically give them a free pass. I mean, to this, the, to this day, there's not one single charge I can think of regarding the Coastal Link uh, gas line violence. I mean, that's reprehensible, is it not? I mean, how hard is it difficult? Is it to find people who mm -hmm. um there's i mean it was in an isolated area how hard is it to find these dozens of operatives running around i mean surely yeah. people know and suspect who these individuals are yeah the the rcmp is definitely believes this was outside agitators so they, they were very they wanted to dissociate from the first nations involved and in saying that these are outside yes but yeah but like you're saying these people were before the february 20 uh 2022 attack these kinds of people were very evident they were out doing things in british columbia out mm -hmm. where the what and the work sites they were there already so yeah and to, mm -hmm. to extent of you know and the police were dealing with them the rcmp was ongoing they had to enforce an injunction on them a couple times so mm -hmm. yeah they, they could see where these guys are so unless yeah we find out a conviction and pending conviction on that which i hope then yeah like um 
But in terms of the Wet'suwet'en, like the blockades that happened in Canada, that definitely affected the economy. Like, mm -hmm. my interest in this paper started back when I looked at the convoy, actually, and I looked at how mm -hmm. the media was covering the convoy, and it struck mm -hmm. me how differently the media was was framing and looking at those people versus the Wet'suwet'en solidarity events a year before, right? Yes. That, right. Uh, you know, that we had amazing amounts of sabotage and affecting that. If you look at, in terms of, you know, with the emergencies legislation, the, the Wet'suwet'en solidarity, that what that uh, really was a national issue because it went from coast to coast to coast even. It went up to the, mm -hmm. you know, so, but you look at the convoy, right? That was pretty localized to Ottawa, mm -hmm. unless you count the blockades, which is separate, right? So mm -hmm. I, I looked into that and I started to notice that these things were being uh, treated differently. You know, like uh, the media was focusing on convoy, trying to link it to foreign foreign funded extremists, which we know now mm -hmm. is false, yeah. right? I remember the CBC was, yeah. was suggesting, could it be Russian funded? Yeah. And then from there, mm -hmm. I, it, to me, it led to a whole, when I looked at, so what people need to to know is like, uh, between when the government invoked the emergencies, uh, legis emergency legislation against the convoy for, for from the um, this coastal gasoline terror attack, they're days apart, like four days. And th the, to me, they'll stand in stark contract of, contrast in terms of one, what actually was a real terrorist attack that the media largely ignored. And, and to this day, that... Like, yes, like the prime minister condemned it and a lot of, like you saw that, but it lasted a day or two, right? The CBC, this is one thing that I really bothered me. Uh, the, the first time uh, when the CBC looked at the, the coastal gas link issue, they, uh, the, the, the fifth estate, right? Their flagship investigative reporting program covered the whole issue. Uh, they, um, they covered a, that particular unit within the RCMP and it was really attempt to demonize them, okay? And it was a 45 minute or so segment. And, but in terms of the February 22nd, the 2022 attack, that they mentioned that it was about 40, 20 to 40 seconds of 40 minutes at the very end of the segment too, right? So mm -hmm. if you're going to marginalize that, I was like, why is this not the focus of this documentary? Why is this not, you know, but uh, the, 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 you know, so my background is in journalism, and I was astounded by the, not just CBC, but the lack of journalistic uh, curiosity, right? Like, like mm -hmm. in looking into these groups, why did they do this? And CBC, the second time, did a, a good piece to its credit about anarchists, but really ignored their ideological motivation. Like, they didn't talk wow. about their beliefs very much. So one of your points then if i'm understanding you correctly joseph is that the media is really a very important institution in our society but they're kind of enabling i don't want to put words in your mouth but are they enabling this eco-terrorism to happen i think i think they are when they downplay it i i, I so the um when, when professor andreas malm from sweden the swedish uh, human ecologist when he wrote that book, how to Bu how to blow up a pipeline, uh, he was platformed by the New York Times, the New Yorker magazine, the Nation. All of these publications gave him a platform mm -hmm. to normalize this, and it was almost like this. And I read one in the, uh, I think it was it was Harper's Magazine, uh, uh, also about uh, a gentleman in the United States that went around to power plants based on an idea that he felt that uh, the, these were leading to the de destruction of, of uh, and climate change and things like that. So okay, if you can imagine someone talking about blowing up, you know, how to blow up a Journalism at credential schools, but that we didn't hear very much about, right? So um, I definitely think that, uh, and I'm a journalist by training. That's kind of my background. But there's a lot of empirical evidence that looks at journalists and does find that uh, there is a 
and particularly public, but all journalists generally have a more, they sit more on the left. And I think that th when it comes to extremism associated with the right, they amplify that mm -hmm. and they make it worse. Mm -hmm. And when it's the left, they just kind of say, okay, well, um, you know, they might be misunderstood and they provide a just, you know, they try to downplay it. Um, and yeah, it's, it's definitely, that needs to be addressed. Mm -hmm. And I think if it wasn't for some independent media, opinion media, like, you know, uh, True North and other sources, uh, rebel media that were actually talking about this, it, we wouldn't really hear this, right? We wouldn't hmm. know what's going on. I think there's another dimension to eco-terrorism and it, and I think you've kind of alluded to this, Joseph, and, um, in my mind, it begs the issue, like one of the, the, the great strengths of our nation has been the ability to have healthy, respectful debate. We can disagree with each other, but we can mm -hmm. arrive at, in the search for truth, uh, mm -hmm. things that we can learn from each other as we try to improve society. And I know that sounds awfully cheesy, but it is true. We can do these discussions in a way that respects each other. That is at the heart in many respects of, of, of good citizenship. But yeah. in this case, it almost seems like we've got people, if I use the metaphor of hockey, that are not even on the rink. They're not wanting to play by the same rules. No. They're wanting to go after people, physically attack your property. Um, and this is really an assault on the Canadian people. This is an assault on their peace of mind and confidence that they can go confidently to their, whether they're on a First Nation, a city, mm -hmm. any community in our country. And this violates their confidence that we live in a peaceful, um, civil society where we can get along with each other. And I think this is very concerning. And it, yeah. you know, it begs in my mind the question, um, if our institutions do not prosecute this, and don't apply a uniform fair law, then it, it, it goes to figure that there's no surprise why so many people hold our institutions in less and less regard and trust. This is a downward spiral, is it not, Joseph? Yes, it definitely is. I think, you know, people, the, 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 the usual caveat, right? Like, you, we have free speech, but you can't shout a fire in a crowded room or theater. Um, that there's lawful advocacy, and we have to trust. People have to trust the the uh, the battle of ideas, that 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 they have credible ideas, that that can win uh, people's minds, their hearts and minds. Mm. But when you when you blockade something, when you blow up something, when you sabotage energy infrastructure, that's not free speech. That's intimidation. That's uh, that's terrorism in some extreme cases. So. It has to be, it has to be uh, st like you, even right now in Canada, like when, you know, with, uh, with, with the, with the Gaza going on right now, you had a lot of people coming out, which is their right, right. on both sides. But then you had sometimes uh, in Toronto, you had some, uh, some, some pro Palestinian groups were congregating at certain areas that were very much close mm -hmm. to Jewish neighborhoods or synagogues or places of worship, mm -hmm. uh, Jewish schools and the, and the and the uh, the authority said that's not free speech anymore that is intimidation that is harassment you're deliberately mm -hmm. like you have a right to um to to say anything you want but you don't have a right to do anything you want or or anywhere you want right and i think mm -hmm. those of on the other side would say well we saw with the convoy people couldn't stay forever in ottawa and doing what they did and and, and you know mm -hmm. and and so Eventually, you have to uh, you have to say that you've you know you've made your point, and people say with some value that you know um, a protest or civil disobedience is about somewhat making people feel uncomfortable, and I get that, and sometimes, mm -hmm. but that can extend to like bodily harm, like if if you lay down uh, on a road and you prevent an ambulance from getting to someone that needs to get critical mm -hmm. care. I'm mm -hmm. sorry, your beliefs, uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> you might think in your mind that they justify it, but it's not. They mm -hmm. never do. And I think that that's what the thing with a lot of the radical, with the ra very unscientific where the climate change that people are believing that 
if they literally believe the earth is on fire, if it's going to, humans are going to be extinct mm -hmm. within five years, which is not true. It's not by the IPCC. It's not, they're not, no one's saying that, mm -hmm. right? Then you take the step in your own righteousness that you can, oh, well, th this justifies me blowing this up or this, that's, that's the crux of terrorism, right? My cause mm -hmm. outweighs your, the right to human safety or human life or, or the yeah, public no, sense of safety, right? right? So we got to yeah, deal so with. So I, I think that's a very good point: is that we kind of cross the Rubicon, if you will, um, as Caesar crossed the the Rubicon River uh, mm -hmm. by Rome, where people really do believe the ends justify the means. So the cause is that morally justified that they can basically put other people's lives in jeopardy because they believe that they are so good and great in terms mm -hmm. of their own moral self-righteousness that they can just simply uh, bully and harass um, our nation. So this is, um, you know, very well said, Joseph, in terms of your call to not ignore this anymore. And I think that this is uh, should be a wake-up call to different decision makers. I think um, the question is, as we get to the the close of our, our discussion, is what can we do about it as citizens? I mean, should we be calling our elected representatives and saying, what the heck is going on when we have all these myriad of violent acts and terrorism against Canadians, including uh, brother, brothers and sisters that are of First Nation background? You're of Aboriginal background. You must hear it from all kinds of people as I do in First Nation communities that they're horrified by this. Um, yeah. We have grinding poverty in different First Nations. And one of the key things as we talk with leaders such as Dale Swampy and so many others, mm -hmm. um, that we need to develop our resource sector as an example so that we can lift everybody into prosperity and opportunity. But so what can we do as citizens, uh, Joseph? Are there some particular actions we should be undertaking? Um, I think the first step I guess on the on the climate file. So we're so we're taking the <laughs> forgive the pun like bringing the temperature down, right? That you know, if if you hear people using alarmist rhetoric or something, or you're at your school, mm -hmm. right? And I notice this. To me, that's the tragedy: is that this is causing serious climate anxiety. They're calling that it's a real phenomenon with particularly children that. They like think real, that in five real years, mental health issues. Yeah, You're yes, real exactly. Mental yeah, health issues. Yeah, are being uh, Na, yeah. Uh, facilitated by these people that should know better, including teachers, yeah. right? Uh, yeah, and I think that that needs to do the temperature uh, bringing down. I think uh, to not allow this to be normalized. I think you know you, if you if you see at your you at your uh, university close to you, they're having a someone who thinks that these tactics are justified, or or, or someone says something and and whatever. A campus newspaper that is normalizing, uh, like at attack, like Coastal Gas Link, or what Just Stop Oil is doing. That you know, oh, it's all justified mm -hmm. because we're trying to protect the planet. You need to mm -hmm. you say no. You know, someone needs to say no. That's not that's not right, and direct them. Mm -hmm. You know, um, I think universities. Uh, so for academic freedom is should be wide, and I'm not saying it should not be wide. There should be a lot of discussion and vigorous discussion but i think that universities when they start talking about sabotage or physical damage or threatening things to people that could affect people's bodily integrity uh universities should not be associated with that like they should be because we all know that if it was a, something associated with the right or something else they would the universities would say no we can't allow that right and so i think um I think just so universities, I think, um, you know, calling media when we see bias, uh, calling out those things. Mm -hmm. And um, mm -hmm. I think and at an extreme thing, I think that, you know, if you uh, if, if you if, if, if you're hearing people that are talking about very extreme tactics like this, I think, uh, you know, this is something that might warrant intervention from. Uh, the, the, you know, security agencies like CSIS has de-radicalization programs, uh, but it usually for involving Islamists, right? Because that's the bulk of mm -hmm. uh, the uh, mm -hmm. terrorist organizations in recognizing Canada are Islamic, Islamist, not Islamic, Islamist in origin. And they have de-radical mm -hmm. and they have ways to intervene 
in communities to stop people from getting any further. And I think in the, in the United Kingdom, they have some of that with, with very extreme environmental groups that if okay. you report someone, you know, I'm not saying, mm -hmm. you know, don't report everyone that, you know, but if you start hearing things about blowing up and, mm -hmm. you know, and things like that, you might help someone become worse, right? Uh, down very the radicalization. Point. So if you had to summarize a number of actions, one of the things we need to do is encourage institutions to do their job, to enforce yes. the law. Let's don't have these double standards. I think what you cited earlier is incisive, where in the UK, as an example, they're naming groups that have been linked based on evidence to violence. So really uh, raising a flag around that, saying that's inappropriate. That's not how our peaceful democratic society works. We don't yeah. intimidate or bully people into submission. We have healthy debate. I think the other thing that you've cited is the importance of people speaking up with their elected representatives. Mm -hmm. um, and I guess what, what you're alluding to is also very fascinating, Joseph, in the sense that are we dealing with such an extreme ideology? And I don't pretend to be a psychologist, but it begs the issue to what extent this is almost a religion for some of these people. It's where they find meaning in their life, where somehow, again, they feel justified that the ends justify the means, that violence is somehow appropriate to undertake. Is that something that you picked up in your research as well, that this is essentially a religion? I definitely think that, you know, as societies become more secular, people are looking at this as like a, a form of religion. I think, you know, we have texts, <laughs> sacred texts associated with it. Uh, one thing that I noticed in that when uh, there was a, a House Sorry, of what, Commons... What do you mean by that? What do you mean by sacred texts associated with this? Well, just like in, environmental uh, books that have come out by various authors that people tend to... Like, uh, you know, this, uh, you know, how to blow up a pipeline or how to... Um, that, you know... All of these organizations that I studied, they definitely, they have seminal texts and they have things and uh, hmm. statements that they have. Uh, if you go on, usually on their website, they'll post things. And, and so it's a very fervent dedication to this. And it is very much, uh, you, they've utilitarian logic to them that the end justifies the means, consequentialist logic, hmm. whatever, you know, and moral philosophy that they've adopted that it doesn't matter like um but it's just all Crazy. the nuance right is lost of course right yeah. like with these kinds of things wow uh, yeah see when i look at this issue i um can't thank you enough joseph for your analysis because really it this issue of ecoterrorism has significant impacts in our society and and uh, we did not even dwell on it significantly, but I can't help think of the whole theme of prosperity. When we look at, um, I believe it was last month, some $48.6 billion of business capital, if memory serves me correctly, left this country. Now, those are very significant movements where money is leaving your country because you're not seen as a stable, viable place to do yeah. business, to yeah. build a place you know, brimming with opportunity, jobs and opportunity. And in that environment, that's really the foreshadow of a declining standard of living. And this is the brutal reality that we're facing that. And I, I think that this type of act of eco-terrorism really moves our country more and more in that direction of decline. And I think this is, in my mind, a tragedy because it not only undermines uh, the life of our fellow Canadians, but future Canadians. It's the next generation that's going to pay the big price when it comes to our inability to think clearly and compassionately, but firmly on ensuring the rule of law survives in this country. And am I looking at this too dramatically, Joseph? Isn't no, no you're looking at it. Line is? It's right. A lot of it is some of these organized interests are trying to sabotage our energy sector to landlock us even more. Um, and I think for the First Nation thing, they do a very discredit to the Indigenous people that they think they're helping. But you look in Canada, most First mm -hmm. Nations, are, uh, that they're located near resource projects, a lot of with the energy projects, it's involving fossil fuels that need to be developed. And uh, so these, these, these projects are key 
And but you have a lot mm. of these groups that think that they are decolonizing and they're 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 sticking it to the oil industry and for four First Nations when they're actually hurting the First Nations in their communities and uh, their their prosperity, like you said. But isn't that ironic? How dare they to coin Greta Thunberg? <laughs> exactly. How dare they go into First Nation communities and tell them that they can't prosper when in fact their democratically elected leaders are saying bring it on so anyways this is yeah unbelievable yeah, it's uh, eco eco colonialism analysis joseph yeah it's mm -hmm. me sorry you what did you e call it? it's it's called eco colonialism where they're trying to telling first nations what to do for an environmental cause yeah there it is we've learned yet again another word from joseph cronell we're so grateful that you could join us today joseph and i want to thank you on behalf of all of us including our audience for your incredible work and your courage in terms of this analysis. So thank you. No problem. Thank you. Welcome. It was a great opportunity. Appreciate it. And thank you, everyone, our audience, for joining us today. Thank you for your questions. And uh, we certainly appreciate uh, your likes and sharing this very important type of information and discussion with your friends. And uh, we certainly welcome your feedback as usual. So we look forward to our next discussion next week, next Thursday at the same time and same place, and have a terrific day. Thank you.